Atacama Desert in northern Chile is the driest place on Earth. It stretches from the foothills of the Andes, a hundred miles westward to the edge of the Pacific Ocean. There are few signs of life here. It hasn't rained in parts for thousands of years. But the very dryness of the Atacama has made it the perfect keeper of a unique treasure. Buried in its sands are the intimate secrets of an ancient world, the legacy of a Stone Age people who believed they could conquer death. The town of Arica on the Pacific coast at the edge of the desert was once a tiny fishing village. For the locals, harvesting the fruits of the ocean is a timeless tradition, a way of life which brought the first settlers here and has supported Arikans ever since. Just how long people have lived here came to light in 1983, when a sensational excavation uncovered an ancient burial ground at the edge of town. The bodies and artifacts that were buried here confirmed that these early people had also lived off the sea 9,000 years ago. But the excavation revealed something even more astonishing. All 96 bodies buried in layers had been mummified. These were the oldest mummies ever found anywhere in the world. The earliest was almost 9,000 years old. A remote fishing community in South America had practiced the art of mummification before the birth of civilization, and at least 2,000 years before the legendary mummy makers of Egypt. Who were the people who carefully mummified this young woman and buried her so reverently in the sand hills of the coast 9,000 years ago? Where did they come from, and what was behind their strange obsession with death? It's been known for some time that an ancient people once lived at the Atacama coast on the edge of the desert. They were called chinchoros, it's Spanish for a small fishnet bag. These bags were found buried with their owners in chinchoro graves. The chinchoros lived a basic lifestyle. They had no metal or ceramics, no wheel or beasts of burden. They left no signs of written language and no permanent buildings. They were a simple Stone Age people. But the way they treated their dead was anything but simple. The Chinchoras mummified their dead, everyone, irrespective of rank or social position, men, women, and children, and the strange thing is, the mummies weren't buried immediately. They kept them on display all around them. Why would they do this? It's one of many questions surrounding the Chinchoras that's intriguing scientists. They believe the answer may lie with the mummies themselves. This is the mummified body of a Chinchorro woman who lived in Arica thousands of years ago. She had been prepared for her journey into the afterlife in a very special way. Of course, you find mummies in many places, but it's only recently that we have come to realize just how unique these Chinchorro mummies are.
Bernardo Ariazza is a professor of anthropology at the University of Nevada and a native Chilean. He's worked with colleagues from a local museum studying the Chinchorros over the past 20 years. Since the Arica discovery in 1983, their knowledge of the Chinchorros has expanded dramatically and it's captured the imagination of researchers in other fields. I think we're just beginning to understand who the Chinchorros are and as we have more specialists coming into the pictures, I think we can have a, a, a rainbow of, of researchers trying to shed light on what was going on with, with the Chinchorro people. The fact is, a people who began the art of mummifying have until now been largely overlooked. One of the reasons why the Chinchorro they haven't received too much attention is because they have very little in the way of cultural materials. They don't have large buildings, okay? they don't have boats. Uh, their technology is, is rather practical technology, but their emphasis was into the dead. Local archaeologist Vivian Standen is leading the present dig. It will be the last for a long time. The reason lies back in 1983 and the famous excavation at Arica. The 96 bodies that were recovered established the Chinchoras as the earliest and most prolific mummy makers that the world had ever seen. But it left scientists with more bodies than they could comfortably process. It also raised the problem of preservation. Vivian Standen was there. On the one hand, it was a positive, exciting and thrilling discovery. But on the other hand, it was very frustrating. There was the problem of preserving these mummies, removing them from the place where they had been for thousands of years without having the right conditions to preserve them properly. It was worrying. It produced conflicting emotions in me. But it had to be done. It was a rescue operation that had to be done, and quickly. The site belonged to a private water company who stopped work just long enough for the mummies to be removed. They were brought to the museum of San Miguel de Zapa, 10 miles outside of Arica. It's part of the local university and a prestigious center of archaeology. To accommodate the sheer volume of skulls, bones, and bodies from the dig, it meant staff had to relocate various pots and artifacts of lesser importance. Even Inca mummies, at one time the museum's major attraction, took a back seat in favor of the newly discovered Chinchora treasures. In a temperature-controlled, air-conditioned annex, the best preserved and most valuable mummies were stored, awaiting examination by the experts. This young woman, wrapped in a reed cape with clay face mask and wig, is a typical Chinchora mummy. Museum staff call her the Black Madonna. The collection has hundreds of fragments of mummies, many of them skulls that have lost their clay face masks. But they contain vital forensic evidence of the Chinchora's health, living conditions, and even cause of death. The first Chinchora mummy ever found back in 1915 was this child. Then no one had any idea that it was thousands of years old. Now, at least, she's surrounded by chinchoras, perhaps even members of her own family. This season, Bernardo Ariazza has brought together a team of experts to help unravel the mystery of the mummies. Hayaya. Hayaya in Aymara. Hayaya. 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 
That was a... Calogero Santoro, a local archaeologist, is a Chinchorro expert who's been on most digs. Probably not only they learn how to do the mummification, but also they, the basic things of the society were also transmitted sure. at the yeah. same time, mm -hmm. when those moments were created. You know. And they would have acted as an incredible, mm -hmm. powerful image to sort of hold society yeah. right. together. I mean, they are the ultimate, if you like. It's kind of like... Dr. Joanne Fletcher from England is a leading authority on Egyptian mummies. She's keen to compare Chinchoro methods with those who mummified the pharaohs. That is an incredibly... Yeah. It's, it's difficult yeah. to get your head yeah. around. Yeah. The Chinchoro story is fascinating. It's a culture that was practising very elaborate forms of mummification at least two, if not three thousand years before the beginning of the same practice in Egypt. Although on the surface their stories did seem comparable, they were um, effectively uh, coming from very different directions. It was a very, very different um, story altogether. But do the mummies of Egypt and Chile have anything in common? Whenever we think of mummies, we inevitably think of ancient Egypt. And the ancient Egyptians were indeed masters of the art of mummification. The body would be taken to the embalmers, who would wash it, and then it would be disemboweled, the internal organs removed, all except the heart. The brain would also be removed and discarded. Then the body would be dried out for 40 days. Then it would be washed again, anointed with oils and resins to seal the surface of the skin. Then it would be wrapped in bandages, in fine strips of linen. After it was placed in the coffin, it would be returned to the family. On the coastal cliffs where the new dig is taking place, there are Chinchorro mummies everywhere, just beneath the surface of the sands. Joanne Fletcher sees her first one exactly where it was left thousands of years ago. Presumably this is a whole cemetery site across here, yeah? Because of the slow, bodies have been exposed for thousands of years, now they are popping up. And what you're seeing here is a natural mummified body. It's absolutely amazing, you can see the the texture of the epidermis, it's, yeah. it's yeah. fantastic. The la uña aquí perdió en el... Here you can see the nails. Yeah, la uña. Una cubierta de arena también. It's very common to, to see this kind of inflammation mm -hmm. of periostitis. Mm -hmm. We can show you some in the lab because Excellent. we have a lot of specimens yeah. with inflammation of the lower legs. It's brilliant to see actually the truly coming out of the ground in front yeah. of us. And this is, is this reed matting that would be associated with the body? Yeah, most yeah. likely because the, the bodies were wrapped with reed mats. That's yeah. exactly um, the kind of thing you'd find. I mean, this is almost exactly like an Egyptian burial in the desert uh, with the reed matting and the soft tissue preserved to this level. This is fantastic. Egyptian mummy making was inspired by the Sahara Desert. It's likely that the Chinchora's first mummies were created accidentally in the Atacama Desert. A mummy is a dead body in which the normal processes of decay have been suspended. Around 9,000 years ago, the Chinchoras simply wrapped their dead in reed shrouds, then carefully buried them in the Atacama, knowing that the dry desert sands would do the rest. Slowly, over a thousand-year period, they adapted this natural phenomenon into an elaborate post-mortem ritual that was completely unnatural. Their mummification technique was absolutely unique. With flintstone knives, they cut off all the flesh. They disemboweled the body, removing all soft tissue and the brain. Then they reinforced the skeleton by tying sticks to the bones. The empty body cavities were packed out with grass, ashes and animal hair, and the skin was reattached. 
Arms and legs were also strengthened with sticks, then individually wrapped with a reed matting. The entire body was covered with a plaster of white ash paste, then stained with black manganese. A clay mask with an elaborate wig of human hair attached covered the face and head. The finished mummy was designed to be moved around, a robust effigy that was very different from the pictorial splendor of the Egyptians. Ironically, the images which are so familiar to us from ancient Egypt aren't mummies at all. Simply looking at the outer casing, we must remember it isn't the individual, it isn't the body, it's simply the outer covering for the body which originally would have laid inside. The body, in the, the case of the chinchero, can't be divorced from the wrappings. It's a complete package. The, the mummified body, the wrappings and the mask, they're incredibly plain and simple, and yet they're very, very modern in their appearance. They've kind of distilled the facial features down to their very basics, but they have nevertheless the ability to move us in an incredible way. Something which the ancient Egyptians never quite manage. Most remarkable of all, unlike anyone else, the Chinchoras carried out their sophisticated mummification processes on their children as well as adults. It seems they wanted to keep all of their dead with them. It's as if, in some sense, they felt they were still alive. At the hillside dig, the team are uncovering strong evidence that this was the site of a Chinchora settlement lasting thousands of years. The location's ideally placed on a steep, sandy slope. Layer after layer of shell middens and other telltale refuse is emerging. Each layer, separated by centuries, adds a snapshot to the archaeologist's picture album of the past. A view of the Chinchora's way of life is emerging. They were a Stone Age hunter-gatherer people who had abandoned their nomadic ways for a more settled existence at the coast. And here they stayed for thousands of years. They had all they needed for a relatively comfortable existence. There were sea lions to hunt and fish to catch. They had cactus needles to make the fish hooks. Reeds from the river valley and animal fur to make clothing and mats. Intricate fishing nets. And delicate little body garments. and shrouds in which to wrap their dead. The picture that was beginning to form was that of a primitive yet highly creative people whose imagination and spiritual energy was not poured into pots, furniture or buildings, but into the mysterious art of mummifying their dead. And as we start to include more um, technological analysis, laboratory technique for the diet, for the radiology or the scanning, then we're really building incredible pictures of the chinchorros. We are reconstructing their daily life. But it wasn't a healthy picture. Chinchorro skulls reveal that this dependence on the sea took its toll. Many males suffered from auditory exostosis, a disease of the ear canal that leads to deafness. So it's a condition you mainly see in, in elder males, right, kind of like right. an inflammation yeah. of the ear. We, we tend to think it's associated with uh, shellfishing, gathering food, mm -hmm. um, diving in cold water. Mm -hmm. And we can see some of the fracture. OK, here you can see a tremendous blow to the, to the head. This was no Garden of Eden. Life was tough at the best of times, and violence was common. Yeah, we tend to see this kind of fracture on the head, mostly in men. This one. Here, we can see some of the fracture of the individual. Well, it could have caused blindness in yeah, at least one eye, one yeah. Yeah, one of the eyes, but still also most on the left side. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the moral of the story is that we see some kind of interpersonal violence in this population. Um, they are not uh, as peaceful as we used to think. Mm -hmm. It was a turbulent life at the coast. Why would the Chinchoras begin to make mummies there? And how do they compare with those of Egypt? Ancient Egypt is always looked to as the, the cradle of mummification, of civilization in so many forms. And yet, it must be realized that the Chinchoro were several millennia ahead of the Egyptians in this, and their art of mummification was no less sophisticated. And so I am incredibly impressed by the Chinchoro legacy. I think their ability to mummify is second to none, and I include the Egyptians in this. So who made the Chinchoro mummies? Who prepared the bodies? There are no written records. There is no direct evidence to say it seems likely that women would have been the ones responsible. It was the men who were going out and diving for fish and sea produce, the food that the Chinchoro relied on. And it would presumably be the women who would then process uh, this foodstuff. And it's a very similar procedure to then defleshing a human being. First the skin had to be removed, then the flesh, and finally the skin was reattached. Only women had the experience to carry out this delicate task. I think women, by and large, are more comfortable around blood. It's it's, it's more of a familiar thing. With the menstrual cycle, for instance, on a regular basis, they are quite um, used to dealing with, with blood. They also perhaps have more motivation towards the preservation of the dead. We know that there was a very high incident of infant mortality, and the incredibly strong bond between mother and child would have perhaps initiated the beginnings of mummification with the mother's desire to keep her child with her at all cost. The way in which the Chinchoro process the dead shows an incredible degree of sophistication. They were very, very familiar with the anatomy of humans to remove the internal organs um, to prevent um, decomposition. You can see here quite clearly uh, the major evisceration scar which has been sewn up and that is exactly um, what we see in ancient Egyptian remains. Um, this is an amazing display of attention to detail, the way that the nails were dressed, the way that the thing was um, then clothed in this beautiful grass skirt and this, these small shoes. It, it, it's, re it's really quite moving. It's, it's a child buried with beautifully made clothes and so forth. This child is little more than a baby. Mummifying children, it seems, was very dear to the Chinchoros. This is the mummy of a very young boy, and yet it's been supplied with the most elaborate wig. You can see on both sides the long hair coming down in kind of these beautiful waves. The vast majority of the artificial mummies do appear to be children. And this is certainly not the case in many other ancient cultures, where children most of the time aren't even given a, a decent burial. Mummification elsewhere was usually reserved for the privileged, the powerful and the rich. It takes time, energy and dedication. Yet the Chinchoras mummified everyone in the most elaborate way, thousands of years before the Egyptians. Why did they do it? And where did these extraordinary people come from? The Chinchoras were the first people to arrive here and settle permanently 9,000 years ago, but their origins are a mystery. There are three popular theories. They could have come by boat from somewhere in the Pacific, but there's no evidence to support this. They could have traveled along the coast from north or south. There is some evidence to support this, 
But Bernardo Arietza has a different idea altogether. I think the Chinchorro came from the highlands, and from the highlands they cut through the desert, which is amazingly dry, and they found these beautiful narrow river valleys that go all the way to the coast. And there they found a little paradise. Because it's teeming with wildlife, shellfish, mollusks of different kinds, um, sea lions, reef and plant to eat. And they settled there. And they settled about 9,000 years ago. We have solid evidence for that. Arietza's theory that the Chinchoras were originally a mountain people who migrated to the coast is supported by evidence that was found a hundred miles away, high in the Andes. Calogero Santora is an expert on the Chinchoras and the nomadic people of the high Andes. He recently found a 10,000-year-old shark's tooth in this cave, 10,000 feet above sea level. It's proof that the people who once lived here must have been to the coast. This is one of the best places for shelter for human beings. About 10,000 years ago, uh, people come over here, they stop for several days probably to take advantages of, uh, of the nice resources that they have here. Water, they have birds. They were hunting the animals that, that are living here today the vicuña, which is this mammal that belongs to the camelid family. It's a small rabbit that is called viscacha, and which is pretty easy to, to hunt. It's the ideal territory for hunter-gatherers, and 10,000 years ago, there were certainly groups of them living here. But something cataclysmic happened to change all that. After 8,000 years ago, something happened in this environment. And we know now from the geologists that there was a huge uh, drought along the Andes. This is coinciding with an explosion of many settlements in the coast. It's very probable that the Chinchoras were a nomadic people who came to the coast when serious drought drove them down from the Andes. But first, they had to negotiate the harsh Atacama Desert. People always want to explore new territories, to discover, to find what is on the other side of the mountain. But I think the Chinchorros were the first to use these uh, corridors, I guess we can call it, starting about 9,000 years ago. At the Museum of San Miguel de Zapa, the job of collating and cataloging Chinchorro relics and artifacts has been ongoing since the discovery of 1983. Their computers now contain a complete database of all available Chinchorro materials and research. It's an important piece of work, and it's being added to all the time. Two Americans who specialize in the non-destructive examination of fragile objects are studying the mummies in their own way. Their findings will feed into the museum's database. There was a lot of cuts on the right side. Ron Beckett and Jerry Conlogue are anatomical detectives. I mean, there's yeah. no way that's anything but that. That is bone. To carry out further analysis, they've come up with the idea of taking some of the mummies to be x-rayed at a local hospital. Well, this is an opportunity to uh, x-ray probably the most unusual mummies in the world. Over about the past eight years, um, 
I've x-rayed a number of mummies, uh, primarily in Peru and at museums in the United States. But these are by far the most interesting mummies. On the individuals that we're able to work on, we will we'll be able to paint a little bit of their story, of their life. Once we get enough data from our preliminary work here and look at many, many, many more mummies of the Chinchero population, we'll be able to add data uh, to give Bernardo and his colleagues m much more data points to work with in recreating what their culture was about. A local hearse lends dignity to a surprisingly moving occasion. It's also the safest means of transport for fragile cargo. It's the mummy's first outing since the discovery in 1983, and once more they're making local history. At this stage, no one has any idea just how important the hospital tests that are about to begin will turn out to be. Well, one of the interesting things about the x-raying mummies like this is you never know what you're going to find exactly. Uh, the kinds of things that the x-ray will be able to determine is relative age, um, the presence or absence of uh, pathology, um, any kind of abnormalities with the bone. And if we were very lucky, we might even be able to detect something that contributed to the cause of death. One of the oldest mummies is the first to be examined. It's eight and a half thousand years old, and the x-rays reveal that beneath the wrappings is a young woman who died violently. The brow ridge is flattened, which indicates more of a female character than a male character, so it's probably a female, maybe 18, This 18-year-old Chinchora girl has serious skull fractures. They may have caused her death. Even more intriguing, there are signs of cut marks on the bones of her legs. These are a mystery. The cortex seems to be broken, so it really looks like it's been cut across here. The girl was naturally mummified by desert winds, so there should have been no interference with the corpse. He thinks that this one over here could be intentional trauma. There's a really attempt to, to affect the individual, while well, this one over here could be more um, cultural practices. Post-mortem. Post-mortem, maybe you're trying to modify the body. It looks more like a... The cuts were definitely inflicted after death, but why? The mummified 18-year-old girl is moved to the CT scan. A CT scan takes high-definition X-ray pictures in cross-sections and at intervals as the subject moves past its scanning eye. The plane film, it was obvious that it was a female. There's little doubt that the girl died from the violent blows to her skull but the cuts on her legs, inflicted after death, remain a mystery. Well, we're seeing some slices through the skull, and there appears to be some residual brain on the right side, uh, which means that when the body was being prepared, it was probably on its right side, so that the brain collapsed to the right. And we can, can see the wrappings quite clearly on the face and the folds and the wrappings around the face. You can see it clearly. Oh, look oh, at that, yeah. The fracture of the mandible. Very, very nice. Very nice. See, yeah. there appears to be a fracture in the back of the skull. Occipital. 
Yeah, the occipital bone, and it's protruding into the foramen magnum. Wow, this looks like quite a bash. It would have taken a lot of, uh, a lot of force. We can tell that the skull is fractured. Whether that brought about the demise of the individual or not, it's impossible to tell. The people from the museum seem to be quite surprised that there were intentional cut marks on this natural mummy. So there must have been some procedure that they went through for some reason. They had to cut the bones, which we don't know. We can make a much better assessment looking with the axial slices through this area than uh, on the conventional x-rays. So right away we can see a fracture mm -hmm. through the femur. There's a fracture right through here. Uh, we can see wrapping. It looks like each leg is individually wrapped. Incredible. The cuts through the girl's leg bones are clearly visible in cross-section. <laughs> you hardly ever see a longitudinal fracture like this, and it's continued almost the entire length of the femur. Incredible, incredible. The, have you seen that before? No. I've never seen I that. I have never, never seen that before. There can be only one reason for the bones to be split lengthways. Oh, it's man. almost as though the marrow cavity has been opened on these bones. Intentionally. It just Find appears as though the bones have been split longitudinally. <laughs> Cutting into the bone to open it up to remove or to access the marrow for whatever reason. I'm sure it wasn't for DNA analysis. This is an observation that we could clearly document from the images. The implications of that are probably going to have to be drawn by the anthropologist. The CT scan reveals details of this mummy's treatment that has shocking implications. And on the right side, uh, the tibias were also split longitudinally. Wow. Cut, cut. You can see on the CAT scan where they were cut into and then separated. Separated. That's very unusual. Very, very, very unusual. We've never seen that. So would be then we're talking about post-mortem alterations? Post-mortem alterations. Mm -hmm. Possibly providing access to the bone marrow. What the scientists are skirting around is cannibalism. It's a discovery they didn't expect and are reluctant to accept. But it might explain why the Chinchoras so carefully cut all the flesh from their corpses before mummifying them. Joe Fletcher's not surprised. Although cannibalism is an incredibly emotive word, we shouldn't let modern sensibilities cloud the way we see these very ancient people. In creating a Chinchoro mummy, you certainly skin the body, remove certain muscles and soft tissue. You use the skin and the bones to then create the mummy, as well as the uh, vegetable matter, the sticks, reeds and so forth. But the, the material that is not actually used in the mummy itself, the, the skin and soft tissue, it seems to me illogical that they'd simply throw it away and discard it. For us today, it's hard to believe or to think in the idea to eat a, 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 a fragment of human of, of a human beings, but in those days, I think that it, was, it wasn't it wasn't something ter terrible, you know. It was something that happened because it had to happen, you know. It was it was part of their of their beliefs, and and and, and that was it. The thing is, it was not eaten because they were shot off food, you know. That's a, that's a completely different thing, you know. It should never be underestimated the importance of, of the, the whole process of birth, of childbirth in these ancient cultures. And for a woman to give birth to a child, to see it die and then want to preserve it and mummify it, it's only a short step away from then uh, wanting to sort of take the child back into yourself to ingest the child, the essence of the child, as an act of love. It's nothing I've ever seen in any other culture. That's kind of turning accepted wisdom on its head. We're looking at a completely different mindset, and that's the exciting thing here. 
the idea that the Chinchoras may have consumed the flesh of their babies is extraordinary. But at the hospital, there are other revelations. These tiny figures, less than a foot long, were found buried with children in Chinchora graves. They may be dolls, but they look exactly like miniature mummies. If they are mummies, their size means they can only be fetuses. Mummifying unborn children is unheard of anywhere. Evidence of bones inside the figures is the proof that's needed. If they are human, we have just one individual or we have several. Very difficult to read. You can imagine an orbit. The conventional X-ray shows no sign of bones, or not enough to be convincing. There's just not enough bone there to really make a definitive statement. So the CT should answer a lot of questions. Each cut is one centimeter. No, these are ten. Ten centimeters? No, ten millimeters. One centimeter. One centimeter. Although they're minute, it's decided to put the figurines through the CT scan. Here we are doing the first scan of these insurer figurines, and we have assumed that there are fetal bones inside, or this is a fetus that was mummified, and are there human bones or not? I hope the scanner is going to tell us that. in the center, interesting. It's so hard to tell. There's, I know. There's something in there. It definitely is. It... Mm. Well, we're looking at a, a, a clay, this area. There are reeds mm -hmm. around here. And what we're really trying to figure out is this shape in the center, is it a skull? There would not be very much bone present if this was a fetus. So we're, we're not going to see it jump out at us the way it would in an older individual. But again, what we're looking for is shape. There certainly is some substance here and here. And uh, again, it would probably be fairly easy to convince yourself that those are plates of the skull, but you can't say that for sure yet. We haven't seen anything really conclusive. The fact that the scan is unclear is expected. These tiny fragments are thousands of years old, and the bone of an unborn baby would be very soft. And anyway, how likely is it that unborn babies would be preserved? It's simply unheard of in any society anywhere in the world. Well, on, on two slices, it really looked like we were seeing a humerus, but now this is way too thick. The, the cortex is the outer portion of the bone. This would be way too thick for a cortex of uh, a fetus. On one slice, we saw something that might be the humerus, but on the next slice, it turned out it probably wasn't the humerus. So uh, I'd have to summarize by saying that we didn't find any bones on this particular mummy. It may be that the soft bones of an unborn baby are too difficult to detect even with a CT scan. Let's see the last one. Is this just the head, this one? Just the head, yeah. A tiny chinchora head, less than two inches by one inch, is the last figurine to be tested. The hospital's leading radiologist has joined the team. His job is to interpret even the most obscure scan. The manganese stops a lot of the x-ray, so it's very white. This is not stopping as much x-ray, and it's a little less white. And you would expect the bone on a fetus to be less dense. But again, the patterns aren't really consistent with bone that I can recognize. The doctor sees something interesting in a new scan of the tiny head, but it's not definitive. And this could possibly be a region around the ethmoid air cells with the eyes on either side, but now the shapes are 
are somewhat confusing. Could be that because of bonds were fragmented and they it, fall and apart could be. different direction, they drifted, or they certainly could be. Within placing the proper anatomical position. Okay, whistles. And then there is something. The, the shape is right for foramen magnum and maxilla. And the doctor confirms that the evidence is there. It's a bone surrounding the eye, very small, but definitely part of the eye socket. This tiny head the size of a golf ball is the mummified head of an unborn child. Yes, it's human, it's human. The formation, the whole structure is there. It's incredible. So the Chinchoros mummified even their unborn. So that's very unique and, and, and intriguing, very intriguing. So why do you need to go to all this extra step to, to mummify and still born? What do we make of a violent, Stone Age society who may have practiced cannibalism and yet respected every man, woman and child and even unborn infant sufficiently to mummify them and keep them on display all around? Did they have a notion of the sanctity of life that comes close to the idea of a soul? I think initially the Chinchoro have been passed over as a so-called primitive society. And this is to define a society in terms of the fact that they had no pottery, they, it was pre-ceramic, they had no writing, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, therefore they must have been primitive. If you look at the Chinchoro society as a whole, the things that were important to them, the things that have remained, that they wanted to remain, were their own bodies, the mummies. They were items to be looked at and appreciated for what they represented. They're trying to preserve the very moment when life ends and death begins, but death is a transition. Hence the fact that so many of these mummies, their faces have open mouths to either take in food, drink, and possibly also the desire to communicate in some way. It's not particularly far-fetched to imagine the individuals within Chinchero society actually approaching the mummies and holding them as objects of veneration. Perhaps with death all around them, the Chinchoras believed that mummification could cheat it, a way of keeping loved ones almost alive. The recent research has fueled a new interest in an extraordinary people who mummified their dead for 4,000 years, then, just as mysteriously, stopped. The museum has built this new Chinchora room that puts the mummies once more center stage among the living, just as their makers originally intended. And at the Atacama coast, there's no doubt the spirit of a people who were once obsessed with death, or perhaps life, and who produced the world's first mummies, is still very much alive. <laughs> 